Welcome to our study on the last episode. We explained the pre-existence of Christ, the Son of God. We spoke of his birth. And now we are coming to that time when Herod the king, realizing that the king of the Jews was born and fearing for his own throne, gave an order that all the little babies under two years of age were to be slain in that country zone of Bethlehem, Ephrata in Judah. Well now, the angel of the Lord warned Joseph to take Mary and the little boy down into Egypt. And those of you who have been to Egypt, those of you who have been to Egypt, you know, it's pointed out to you where the Holy Family sojourned during that time of the genocide of Herod. It's interesting that we likened, of course, Christ to Moses because Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like unto himself and uh, that was Christ. But, um, you know, at the birth of Moses in Egypt, the king, Pharaoh, gave an order that all the Jewish uh, children were to be slain. Well, that's exactly what happened at the time of the birth of Jesus. You see, Satan knows when a deliverer is to be born. And so often he tries to kill that deliverer and unsuccessfully because God protects at his birth. And so that was the reason for the genocide of King Herod. Satan wanted Christ slain before he could fulfill God's plan and purpose for his life. Well, they went into Egypt. And then as Hosea the prophet says in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, and <clears throat> again about 700 years before this event, it says, I called my son out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of this world, and of course Christ has to fulfill, if I could say this uh, in type, many spiritual truths. And we are called out of Egypt. We are called out of this world to walk with God. Well, he was called out of Egypt after Herod had died. And then he was led, that is the father Joseph was led, to Nazareth. And he was called a Nazarene. Well, that's where he lived. Now that's a very interesting thought. Because you see, later on when he had reached manhood and he was calling his disciples unto him, you know, Philip comes to uh, uh, Bartholomew and says, you know, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Bartholomew said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth had a terrible reputation as a town. You know, we're so often concerned about where children are raised. You know, surely the environment is very important indeed and one seeks the best environment for one's children. But the Son of God was brought up in a town which had a terrible reputation for ungodliness. And yet God kept his Son pure and holy in that in fact, <clears throat> during his first 12 years, he was learning the scriptures. And <clears throat> there came this Passover, when all good Jews go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And <clears throat> Joseph and Mary took Jesus down to Jerusalem. Well, it was an extended family. And the parents didn't watch over their children very carefully, thinking they were with the cousins, thinking they were with friends and so forth. And 
When it was time to leave, Joseph and Mary left and it wasn't until about the days on the journey that they realized Jesus was missing. They searched for him frantically. They found him not. And so sorrowfully, they went back to Jerusalem. Where was Jesus? Well, after about three days, they found him in the temple. Now, he's only a 12-year-old boy. But in the temple, he is discoursing with the doctors of the law, learned people who knew the scriptures. He was asking and answering their questions. And all were amazed. And Joseph said to Jesus, Did you not realize that your mother and I have been sorrowing? And he turned to them and said, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? For Joseph full well knew that Joseph was not the father, but God. Well, after that, he became subject to his parents and grew to manhood And we are told that he grew in grace and favor with God of man. He was an obedient son. Well, during that time, Joseph, the carpenter, died. We're not told exactly when, but Jesus assumed the responsibility for the livelihood of the family. And he worked in his father's carpenter's shop until the time came when he must assume the role for which he had been ordained before the foundation of the world and that he had to leave that carpenter's shop. Well, a friend of mine, a very godly pastor, had a vision of that last day. And he saw the Lord finishing a table and then looking at it with intense satisfaction that it was perfectly made and then putting his tools away in their respective places for neatness and order is a symbol of godliness. He then folded up his own apron, his carpenter's apron and put that in its appointed place and then went to the door opened it and looked back in the last time he would look at that room at that carpenter's shop as a carpenter but now he's going to make his way down from Nazareth alone down the road to the river Jordan there he is going to meet his cousin John the Baptist now John the Baptist had been preaching under a heavy anointing of God and all Judah was coming out to him Judah recognized that this man was a prophet and they sent to him and said art thou Elijah he said no they said art thou the Christ He said, no, I am not. Then they said, who are you? And he said, I am the voice in the wilderness saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. In other words, John said, I am the forerunner. I am the one who's going to introduce the Messiah. And he declared all the things that the Messiah would do. One of the things he declared was this. He said, I indeed baptize you with water for repentance of your sin. But there cometh after me one greater than I, for he was before me. Now, physically, John the Baptist was older than his cousin, Jesus. But he said, because he was before me, declaring the fact that Jesus was eternal the eternal one so here he was declaring unto all Judah and in fact Israel too that the Messiah was coming and he declared all the things 
that Jesus would do the mighty miracles. He declared, you know, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he spoke of the power that Jesus would manifest. Well, the time came when Jesus came into the presence of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist knew who he was and said, you know, I have need to be baptized of you. I'm not worthy to touch, even to do up the laces of your shoe. And Jesus made this very profound statement. He said, but it's given unto us to perform all righteousness. And so, at that time, Jesus submitted to being baptized in water in the river Jordan by his cousin John the Baptist now John the Baptist was a very great man Jesus later on gave this testimony concerning John the Baptist and he said there has been none greater born of woman than John the Baptist in other words he was elevating John the Baptist to the place that Moses and Elijah had in fact of John the Baptist his father when John the Baptist was going to be born and after he was born you know the father said this he has come in the power of Elijah the power of Elijah so obviously John the Baptist had tremendous power all Israel recognized that he was a, uh, a prophet even the hypocrites came out to be baptized and John the Baptist didn't mince his words and he called them vipers, hypocrites. You know, but anyway, here he baptizes Jesus. What happened at his baptism? Well, at the baptism of Jesus, remembering that he is the Son of God, he, he comes out of the water and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes upon him. And at that moment he's anointed with the seven spirits of God, the Spirit of the Lord that gave him the eloquence to preach. Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the might of the Lord, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. In fact, we're told that he had the Holy Spirit without measure from his Father. And then a voice from heaven comes. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know, those formative years were so very important. And we read nothing about those formative years except when he was a baby, when he was born, when he was 12 years of age in the temple. And then, when he came, at about the age of 30, Luke tells us, to that river Jordan, to be baptized by John and start his ministry. But Isaiah the prophet gives us an understanding of what was happening. And Paul helps us with the interpretation. What Isaiah tells us concerning Christ during those formative years was this he said he was the arrow of God and you know an arrow if I could use my fountain pen as an illustration here an arrow has basically two parts one is a very sharp point that enters in to the target and this other part which is wood is highly polished and that part ensures when it's put into the bow of the soldier that it is going to be aimed and hit the mark well first of all Isaiah and Isaiah 49 tells us this that 
he was named. Yeah, you know, his name was mentioned when he was in his mother's womb. And that we know. Because the angel said to Joseph, you know, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And then it says, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Well, that was very true because at the age of 12, he was able to confound those doctors of the law with his knowledge of the word of God. Why? Because he is and was the word of God made flesh, as John said. His mouth was like a sharp two-edged sword. It was filled with the word of God. So those doctors were confounded by his understanding of the scriptures. But then, from the age of 12 until about the age of 30, he was hidden under the shadow of his father's hand. We read nothing. But we are told that he was being made a polished shaft. Now, there are two aspects of the nature of Christ. First of all, he was son of God. He could not sin. But he was also the son of man, and he could have missed the mark. And so, he is being polished because the wood speaks of our humanity. And so, Christ, during those formative years, from about 12 nearly to 30, he was being polished Paul gives us the interpretation in Hebrews when he says he learnt obedience by the things that he suffered. Although he was the son of God, he learnt obedience by the things that he suffered. And so, during those formative years, he was learning obedience because, after all, he was the word of God, yes, but he had to hit the mark and fulfill the law as a man. Well, then something else Isaiah tells us. He was put into the quiver, his father's quiver. Now, what is a quiver? What is a, it's a little, shall I say, bag that an archer carries, and arrows are placed in there which are ready for use, but the archer is not yet ready to fire them. So we know that Christ was ready before the time, but he had to wait patiently until the time that his father had designated for him to be, if I could say this, baptized in water and presented to Israel. So here is the polished arrow at the river Jordan and filled with power and we could liken Christ now to an arrow of God being put in the bow and ready to be fired to hit the mark what was the mark? it was a cross Satan knew this and so Satan was permitted to tempt Christ. And so, coming out of the river Jordan, we find that the Spirit of God was upon him, but drove him, we are told by the Gospel writers, into the desert. And there, for forty days and forty nights, he did not eat, he did not drink. And there he was with the wild beasts, the wild beasts of the desert. And then, after 40 days and 40 nights. And you say, well, why after 40 days and 40 nights? Well, 40 is the number of a trial, but also, physically speaking, when one fasts, after a time, hunger leaves. But then it comes back with all its cruel desires and lusts and it consumes the human body with cravings to eat. 
And so here we have Christ physically at his lowest point and Satan comes. And Satan comes and he comes with scripture because Satan knows the word of God. And he said, if, if, if thou be the son of God. But don't forget, He's at the weakest point, and Satan says, if, if. You know, that is one of the most powerful weapons of Satan, doubt. It's the same weapon he used with Eve. When he said, you know, can you eat of all the trees of the garden? And Eve said, of everyone except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan said, Hath God said? He put doubt into the mind of Eve. And then Eve succumbed to that doubt. And she took that fruit. And she became a sin. She doubted the word of God. And this is exactly what Satan wanted Christ to do. To doubt that he was the son of God. He said, well, look, if thou be the Son of God, then you could command that these stones be bred. Well, Jesus responded and said, it is written that man shall not eat of bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, our natural food is necessary, yes, but there's something more than that. We have to hear from God day by day. Either through the scriptures, reading the scriptures, or God speaking to our heart, or through others. You know, hearing from God, our inner soul is nourished, we're told, after knowledge. Well, Christ refuted that temptation. Then, Satan took him up into the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, this is written, that you can cast yourself down, and he will give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. Well, he was quoting scripture, right? But Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And that's something that we must be very careful of doing, tempting God and daring God to do something. You know, us going out on a limb and say, Lord, save me. No, 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 we must not tempt God. And then Satan said this, knowing that Christ would be the King of kings and Lord of all and all the nations of the earth would be his, all the glories of heaven. He said this, he said, if, again if, thou be the Son of God, worship me, and all the kingdoms of this world, and he had the ability to show Christ at that time, all the glories of the nations. He said, and I will give them to you. Well, why could he say that? Because he's called the prince of this world, you see. It wasn't until Christ died and defeated Satan on the cross that Satan lost that power over the nations. Well, there we are. And Christ triumphs gloriously. And then he commanded Satan to leave him. And then the angels of God came and ministered to him. Because God had given the commandment, that's God the Father, had given the commandment that all angels should worship him. And they came, they ministered unto him. And then he came back. He came back to the place where near where he'd been baptized and John the Baptist saw him and it was now that John the Baptist was going to indeed present him to Israel but how did he present him to Israel we've said that you know Satan recognized him as the king of kings and Satan was not afraid to offer him all the nations of the world because if he had done that, he would be the servant of Satan. But, you see, the thing that Satan was afraid of 
was Christ going to the cross because there he would destroy the power of Satan. So how did John the Baptist present Christ to Israel? He didn't present him as the king of kings, but he presented him as the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist knew that the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was dedicated to going to the cross and dying for us. And so that's how he indeed presented him. Well, there were two of his disciples there, Peter and John. And, I beg pardon, Andrew and John. And they indeed heard that and they followed Jesus because there in Jesus they saw the one of whom John had promised would come, the Messiah. And so they followed him. And that's what we want to invite you to do, dear ones. You know, to recognize who Jesus is, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world and that you will do as these two early disciples did. You will follow him. And they said to him, No, Master, Rabbi, where do you live? And he said, Come and see. And if we will follow him, the Lord will show us so many wonderful things and grant unto us his so great salvation. May the Lord encourage you to follow him as did those early disciples. God bless you.